the people involved who made it what it was were they were legit and like they believed i've i've been i've talked with a lot of them at this point like they really believed in the mission they believed in the value to the underground and i think that's the big part of why it became this cultural cornerstone Greetings, friends, and welcome to episode 201 of Into the Necrosphere. This week, I am joined by the great Chris Grieg of Woe to talk about their fantastic new record, Legacies of Frailty, as well as Amp Wall, a product that he is working on as a potential competitor possibly even a replacement to Bandcamp. Uh, we got in deep on what that looks like, uh, what it means, why he started it, and much, much more. It is going to be coming your way very shortly, but before we get to that, Chris Krieg is not only a dab hand around a black metal riff, but turns out he knows how to produce top-tier death metal as well. And he does so under the guise of a band called Glorious Depravity. They put out their debut record in 2020. It's called Ageless Violence. It's available right now on Translation Loss Records. And here they are now with a song called Forced to Witness.
You just listened to Forced to Witness by Glorious Depravity of their debut album, Ageless Violence. It's available right now on Translation Lost Records. Uh, and you can check out their Bandcamp link in the description to the podcast. If you buy yourself any music, then let them know that it was old Jackson at Into the Necrosphere who sent you. And also let them know that it's been three long years since that album saw the light of day. And it's probably time for them to get back to work. Uh, if you're new to the podcast and you like what you've heard so far, then smack the subscribe button like it owes you money on your platform of choice uh leave me a five star review particularly on spotify and apple podcasts that really helps the show uh and if you truly want to show your love and support for the podcast uh you can share the episode with a friend foist it on an enemy and then head over to the into the necrosphere teespring store and pick yourself out a t-shirt or a hoodie or whatever else catches your eye uh also make sure that uh, you are following my fellow horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse on a Monday, we get things started with Brandon Legion providing another installment of his excellent podcast, Horror Wolf 666. Yours truly casts hexes and slays poses every Tuesday on Into the Necrosphere. Sensei Mike Hill brings you another episode of his long running podcast, Everything Went Black, every Wednesday. He returns every Thursday alongside his co hosts, uh, Sheriff Mike Scandado and Professor Jeff Kashid, with one of my favorite podcasts podcasts of the week necromaniacs and then every sunday the reverend carl hikara brings you a deep dive into the weird the arcane and the esoteric with his podcast soul Knox. and then finally lurking in the shadows not uh, burdened by routine and regularity uh, is the great cheyenne of the band trivax uh, he drops iblis manifestations his podcast uh, really when it's when the mood strikes him but it is always absolutely top-notch when he does so uh, when my conversation with Chris is over, don't go anywhere because this week I am going to be doing a roundup of some of my favorite releases of the uh, last couple of weeks. Uh, that includes albums by The Amenta, Cult Burial, Sledeer, and Sulfur Eon. And then it is time for another weekly installment of the News Rant. Uh, we are going to be talking this week about uh, new music by the likes of um, A Legion, Satan's Fall, Kylie Calling and many others they will all be rounded up for judgment and we'll decide whether or not they cut the mustard but for now sit back and enjoy as i welcome to the podcast for the first time most definitely not the last time chris grieg of woe welcome to into the necrosphere and dude i for so two things i want to i want to cover firstly legacies of frailty I, I, I wanted to make a special mention of it on last week's podcast because I think it's such a great album. And I, I was so worried listening to it. It was one of those that immediately I listened to it and then you kind of get, it's one of those records you get stuck on and you just want to, you know, go back to it over and over and over again. I was like, it would be the worst thing imaginable if this gets lost in the, in the, the craziness of everything else that's coming out right now because there's so many other good records coming out. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about Amp Wall. Because so so to set the scene for folks listening to this news at this uh, in in the year of our Lord October the nineteenth has come out that um, Epic has sold Bandcamp to Song Trader. Song Trader and Bandcamp clearly have some degree of overlap in their staffing, so they're going to make half of Bandcamp redundant, and effectively Bandcamp seems to be headed for ruin, at least as far as we're seeing. In the meantime, somehow you've you've looked into some sort of mystical orb and you've you've seen the you've seen the future upon the horizon and thus the birth of amp wall so 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 tell people that don't know yet exactly what this is first and foremost and then we'll get into how this got started how you came up with the idea for it sure sure yeah man um first thanks so much for having me uh thanks so much for for taking interest in in legacies of frailty um yeah so 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 amp wall all right so i uh, uh sometime last year uh sacrificed 666 goat and the message came to me you know that this was my mission uh no so yeah you know i've been so so uh, you know amp wall was kind of the the natural destination for me in a lot of ways i'm i've been 
you know, I've been playing music since I was, since I was a, a kid, I'm going to be going to be 40 next year. So I've been doing this a long time Been doing woe for uh, 17 years, something like that. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've always been involved with independent music, underground music through woe, through my other bands, through, I did a lot of recording and producing for, for a few years there. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't really have much of a life. Like I just, uh, everyone I socialize with for the most part, like we're all in bands. We've all been doing this for a long time. And it's, you know, I socialize when I, when I rehearse or record or play shows or something. Um, so this is my, it's my whole life. Um, and I've also always been a technologist, right? Like I've always, mm. I've, I learned when I was, when I was really little, I started learning about coding. You know, I wanted to make video games. I learned to do some basic web stuff to make websites for my bands in high school. This is like the nineties. Um, I, you know, I've, I've always just built, built stuff. Um, I see software development, like writing code for me is, is a real creative endeavor. It's really similar to songwriting. You know, you, in songwriting, you've got, you got a few notes and you put them together and you've got some chords, you put some chords together, you've got a riff, you put some riffs together, you've got, wind up with a song, you put some songs together, you got an album, you change the order of things. You can get vastly different feelings, convey different ideas by just making little changes, right? Tweaking mm-hmm. the orders of things or the durations of things. Code code is is really similar. Um, you know, you 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 have a few characters by themselves, they don't do anything, you put them together, you've got some variables, you've got some functions, you've got some classes, you've got, you know, before you know it, you've got a page on a screen and some buttons and you 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 mix and match these things and the same code in a different order can give you very different outputs. So it's, it's, it's creative and it's, uh, it's exciting. So, you know, back when, well, when woe started was, uh, first album was 2007, I think. And you no, know, now downloading, downloading was still huge. Right. Um, you know, we were, we were coming out of the Napster era, but we were big on SoulSeek. I was about to say, you had SoulSeek, uh, you had LimeWire, Soul- you had everything. Yep. SoulSeek, SoulSeek in particular was how I found, like, fucking everything. So, um, you know, downloading was, downloading was big. And, but we had started to see some bands, like I remember Nine Inch Nails and Radiohead both had successful pay what you want di- digital campaigns where they were like, well, people are going to download it. You know what? Just, just put it out there and see if people will support us because they want to support us. You know, they don't have to, but we'll see. And it went well. And uh, I thought that was really cool. And I remember, I remember uh, this day where I was, you know, I was at work. It was the daytime. I was in a, getting out of my car. I was in a parking lot. This was early smartphone day. So I had like an Android, uh, a Droid 2 or something, Droid 1. And I remember looking at my phone and, and a Google alert or something told me that the new Woe album that had just come out, the first Woe album that I did as a solo project, was available on some Russian blog torrent site. And people were downloading it. And on one hand, I was like, oh, fuck yeah. Like People want to hear my album. On the other hand, I was like, oh, you know, I worked hard on that. Yeah. I'm going to build, I'm going to build my own. I'm going to build, I'm going to do what, what Nine Inch Nails and Radiohead did. I'm going to build my own. And I knew just enough code to build my own pay what you want download service that I used for the first wall album and did, did okay. Um, I expanded it to let some other people in that did okay. You know, some other bands were using it. And then a year later, Bandcamp showed up and their product was super sick. And the people who built it were professionals and, uh, you know, I was like, well, I know when I'm beat, you know, I wasn't a professional software engineer at that point. So I folded that up and I've been using Bandcamp ever since. Um, this is, by the way, this is the fucking long story here. So No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very curious about it. But just just a, a comment very quickly. It is crazy how Bandcamp over the last couple of years has become such a staple of yeah. being in a band, yeah. you know, being anywhere within the orbit of the music industry. Um, yep. you know, I'm, I think I'm so used to saying, you know, after I play a song by a band, I'll post the band camp link in the band description camp. to the podcast, go check it out. Um, it's crazy to think that like, firstly, I could never quite put my head together. Why, 
Epic uh, why, why Epic bought them, right? I, it never made sense to me. Like, what? Where does this fit in the product portfolio? Where does this fit in the? Um, you know, I, like I could I, I could understand some of the other acquisitions that Epic made, but never Bandcamp. Now, yeah. clearly, it seems to me that that it someone somewhere snorted a you know a couple of lines of the old snow, decided I'm going to buy Bandcamp, bought it, and it's a fuck up, and they've sold it to Song Trader. Um, yep. But. Like, are you as a, you know, especially given that you've just put out a new record now, are you seeing a difference in the quality of service you're getting from Bandcamp and in the quality of traffic that's coming through from Bandcamp? No, not at all. Not at all. The, um, not at all. Bandcamp is still, I mean, it's, it's a big source. It's a big source. It's, it is my primary source. It's really the only source of meaningful revenue that comes through for, for Woe and for merchandise. Um, that bothers me. Frankly, it bothers me. You know, I think, you know, I think for, for a really long time, they, Bandcamp has been crucial for independent music. You know, when I was starting my thing and they showed up and with a better product, I was, I, I wasn't mad about it because they do, a, they do a good job. Mm. The people who ran, run, ran, I don't even know, past, present tense, the people involved who made it what it was were they were legit and like they believed I've, I've been, I've talked with a lot of them at this point. Like they really believed in the mission. They believed in the value to the underground. And I think that's the big part of why it became this cultural cornerstone. Right. I think you look at, you look at the music market, right? Like independent music, like what is available for, for guys like us, for bands like, like ours. And if you, if you look at the domain, your options for a long time were gigantic corporations and Bandcamp, right? And there were streaming services that pay you fractions of a penny or Bandcamp, uh, you know, streaming services where you never actually own any of the music that you download and Bandcamp, it's DRM free. And Bandcamp was, you know, like Spotify exists for Taylor Swift. Bandcamp mm. exists for you and me. And that was powerful, right? Especially because it, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't bullshit. It was it, the people building it believed it. Right. <clears throat> so when with, with Bandcamp's sale to Epic about uh, 18 months ago, maybe a little more at this point, um, the, a lot of that confidence was, was damaged. And, um, that was around the time that I started to think really hard about who, how, what, how, what, who, who do we depend on and how fragile is our independent music world yeah. is that we have one, we had one choice for direct sales. And obviously, you know, there are choices for merch sales, right? You can open a merch store with any number of companies. Big cartel are fantastic fantastic mm. independent ethical company um but where digital sales are concerned where that community engagement is concerned bank camp is all you got and overnight one morning we all woke up and there was a press release on september 28th saying uh surprise we've been or not september september 28th was the song trader announcement we, we woke up to a day i think in march or april of last year and it was like ah, actually now we're just another we're just another corporation we're another corporation with market cap of 32 billion dollars and you know so so that made me really wake up and say even if the product never changes even if it's the same product with the same people fundamentally independent music must have other options independent mm. music cannot diy cannot exist on the back of one or two or even you know any number of of corporate corporate overlords right i it just we just we need options and as as we think more and more about the role especially the role that big tech plays in our lives and, and concerns about privacy and data ownership and the growing role of tech like AI that can, you know, is going to influence our, our future. I think that DIY music needs DIY options. Mm. Um, and 
you know, I have this, I'm a software engineer. It's what I do professionally. It's what I've done for a long time. I'm a musician. Like I have these issues. Like I want more from Bandcamp. So I decided I was just going to do something about it. And, you know, I, I, honestly, like there's, there's a lot more to it than that. It's not purely the ethical piece. I frankly, you know, there are things that I've always wanted Bandcamp to do. There are features that I've wanted. There are areas where I think it could be better. And I just think a different perspective, like competition is good for the market. Competition is good for consumers. Competition is good for artists. Mm. Um, I just want a different, I have a different vision. I want to go a different direction with it. Um, I want to try new things. Uh, I want to, I don't know. I want to build shit. I want to, I want to make cool stuff and contribute. Well, so here we are. You, you, you've kind of not quite directly said it, but I mean, I think, I think what you've highlighted is the, is how essential it is to build resilience into the model, you know, in, in order to be able to preserve that DIY ethic and in order to be able to preserve the independence of a lot of artists, because I've had a lot of bands on this podcast who outright said, I don't want to, I don't want to sign to a label. My, my preference is to retain my Bandcamp presence, manage that myself, and I'll put out stuff on Bandcamp and then, you know, people can listen to it if they want to, if they don't want to, that's fine. But I don't want to be beholden to a, a, a record label at all. So I think Bandcamp as a, as an entity or as at least as a function is incredibly critical. Yes. Um, and as, as you've, as you've highlighted now, the, the issue is if there's only one, if there's only one option that, that that's a real problem because it means that if anything were to happen and that option were to go away, all of a sudden, and you know, an, an entire scene collapses. Um, entire, multiple scenes, man. I yeah. mean, it's, yeah. And, and one of my, one of my best friends, we were talking about the bank camp situation and he remarked to me, I feel like I'm watching my childhood home burn down. And that's when your childhood home exists at the mercy of a corporation with a market cap of $32 billion. That's a, that's, that's not a, that's a, that's a very dangerous position to be in. And you, that's a whole, that's not just the metal scene. That's the punk scene. That's yeah. independent pop. That's, you know, that's underground hip hop. That's, I mean, it, it goes and goes and it, uh, it's a problem. It's a problem. Um, also the, you know, the product hasn't changed in a long time. The fees are prohibitive. Uh, once you get to a certain size, um, there, there are, there are things that they could do better. Uh, so I just, you know, I've, that's where I started out was like, I can do, I want to do this better. I want to do it better. I want to do it different. I want to offer more options. And that was where I was been building all year. It's where I was all year. And then, the song trader sale happened and I was like, well, I guess we're moving our timeline up. We're going to announce this early. Um, we're going to, we're going to put the word out there. And I, at the time, so I announced this on the same day as the new low albums release September 29 legacies of frailty came out. And uh, I was like, all right, I'm going to buckle in. I'm sure I'm going to, you know, hear from some people. It's going to be, it's going to be a hell of a day. But I was, you know, the night before, uh, my wife and I were, were winding down for the night and I was like, Hey, just so you know, we're announcing tomorrow. We're announcing tomorrow. I know we talked about waiting a few months. We're doing it tomorrow. And uh, it, it exploded. It exploded. It was, it was insane. Uh, is, is your wife involved in the making of it? Um, or is she, is she involved in any of the business side of things? So she, she's also a software engineer. Um, she is, uh, she's a brilliant person overall. Um, very talented software engineer, smarter than me. She has a college degree. I, you know, I'm a fucking dropout. Uh, but she's, you know, she's, she's an artist. Um, and she is a, just a, like a brilliant thinker with a very critical eye with a high, high standards and high expectations for, for the things she works on. Um, so she's, uh, contributing a lot on weekends and at night. Um, just polishing things up, telling me that things that I think are done are not really done. Uh, just, just uh, making sure that things are, are more buttoned up and weighing in on a lot of, uh, decisions and things. Um, so yeah, man, uh, you know, so we announced the 29th and then things, you know, the mailing list exploded, inbound messages exploded. And then, uh, with the announcement of the layoffs, on Monday, which was the 18th, I mean, was that 16th now, mm. October? Uh, it's like a round two. Um, inbox is exploding. Messages are exploding. Mailing list is exploding. Uh, just this massive outpouring of interest and support. 
from people who from all walks of life, um, you know, musicians and labels and journalists and software engineers and artists and designers and just people who just want to say they think it's cool. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. And it, let me, you know, let me, let me ask you game. this, how many, cause I, I, I've obviously been onto the, the ample website. How many people have you had sign up to the mailing list ball, ballpark figure? Uh, um, <laughs> more than 1500, uh, yeah. in a span of two weeks. Yeah. Um, three weeks, something like that. Uh, and it's, I mean, every time I look, it's, it's higher. Um, but it's not just, you know, 1500 plus it's, it's all of the biggest independent metal labels that you can think of every, like people who won't reply to me when I send them woe demos, uh, you know, like it's, it's, it's that, Plus, you know, the messages I'm receiving through the text message, my, my DMs on various platforms, the direct emails that I'm getting. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. So, uh, you know, we're um, very optimistic. Um, my, the bassist from my death metal band, Glorious Depravity, is uh, joining as my co-founder. And he has more experience on the business side of things. And uh, John is also going to be playing bass and woe uh, live going forward. And um, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to kind of uh, get our, get our ducks in a row and continue building, um, working hard to, to, to plan how to release this thing, how to get people in the door and um, start, you know, start getting people on, getting people selling stuff. What's exciting for me is if this takes off, then this is going to be one of the very first, this is going to be one of the, 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 the founding first. interviews. So yeah. Um, the, the first. Now the here's first. a, here's something that sits with me. I, you've watched, um, uh, what's his face? Uh, what's the fucking movie called? Uh, the movie about Facebook. Um, uh, the, the, the social network, the social network. There's a, there's a scene that sits with me where um, Justin Timberlake's character talks about changing, you know, the guy, like he, he plays the guy that founded Napster. He talks about changing the name from the Facebook to Facebook. And he, he, you think, like, I remember seeing that scene for the first time thinking to myself, it's so simple, but it made such a massive difference. I love the name Ampwall. Thank so you. So how, you, how did you come up with that idea? I, you know, I don't know where it, I don't, I don't quite remember. I don't quite remember like where the idea came from. I think I was thinking about, you know, brainstorming, naming things is tough. Naming things is really tough. Bit massively, um, which, which is why I'm so impressed by it because it's like, I always, <laughs> I always look at something like, you know, I look, I'll, I'll look at loads of new, new apps that come up and you look at like, you look at Uber and you go, Jesus Christ, that's such a brilliant name because it, it's it's when the name kind of enters the vernacular or enters the culture yes. and, and almost becomes a verb. It's like, yeah. oh, there we go, you've nailed it. And that's, I'm, uh, it's it's so funny you say that because that's a thing I that's a an idea that I come back to a lot. How a name, <laughs> a good name doesn't necessarily have to be good. It has to not suck and not be distracting because at a certain point the name stops being the 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 composite pieces right it's it stops being like the components and it starts becoming just it's uber like it doesn't mm. like yeah that's a real word but you know it's it's facebook it's instagram like those those are they are entities they're they're containers for value right they're containers for value they don't you're not you don't read them literally um but you still want something that at best doesn't get in the way or at worst doesn't get in the way and at best comes out the gate with a certain amount of uh, a certain energy to it. Right. Mm. So amp wall, I think was, you know, I don't, I don't know where it popped into my head, but I remember it, um, I must've been just combining different words and, and it sort of appeared in front of me. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's it. That's the one, you know? And it's, I, I, it's it's funny because the non rock people, the non metal people, they don't they don't necessarily get it. But you you say it or you put it in front of a, a person, you know, from our background, and they're they're like, 
fuck yeah. It's very evocative. Yeah. You, you, know? you, you kind very. of immediately, you see the Marshall stack and it, it yeah. uh, okay, makes perfect yep. sense. Makes perfect sense. Yep. Yeah. And I think uh, I've already had a couple of people ask like, well, it's called amp wall. Is it for, for, for music that isn't, isn't rock, which of course, of course it is. And that's a, a question I think I'm going to get for a little while, but then you, you stop and you think about it like band camp, band camp has plenty of people who are not bands and never went to camp. Yeah. And it, didn't you know maybe some people early on it, it got in their way but uh, long term the name we want to reach a point where the name is that container for value container for mm. meaning that uh, is sort of disambiguated from where it started you know so how many how many folks do you have working on it in total you've got your wife you've got your co-founder have you got anybody else that you've already hired <laughs> We've got all of three. Uh, so it's, it's the two of them. And, you know, Lauren is, Lauren is very much, my wife is very much off the books. Uh, just, just she's an outside contributor nights and weekends uh, on her personal computer, you know, not to interfere her with her work. And then John is, you know, pretty much the same thing, spare time uh, helping out. And then it's me full time. And I am doing all the software engineering um, a lot of the, the, you know, the majority of the, the concepts and the direction. And, and obviously I'm the, the guy out here talking a lot of shit, uh, trying to, you know, proselytize a little bit. Um, so right now it's, it is a full-time team of one. Uh, we're working on changing that. I think, you know, the, the, the we're, we're living in a very unique moment and we have, uh, we have some opportunities to, to, to get some funding and keep this going. I'm, I'm right now living off of savings and the 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 generous support of my my loving partner, but uh, there there are limits to that. You know, we're not wealthy people, so at a certain point, we're going to have to figure out how to keep the lights on, or I'm going to have to you know go back to go back to part time. But um, right now, all the signs indicate that we're you know we're moving in the right direction. We're you know we're committed, and we're going to get this. We're going to get this done. And, and have you got a have you got a, a a date or a time span in mind for when you might want to launch? Yeah, so we've um, the original plan was this. The, the The original plan was this, and it's it's not not changing too much. Um, you know, I've been building throughout the year. I took a little break to finish the Wall album, but uh, I've been building pretty pretty much pretty consistently throughout the year. The plan was launch around the time of the album release so i could start selling wo merchandise as a way of testing it you know uh, the last thing i want to do is let a million people in and then discover that it sucks or it can't handle yeah, the traffic yeah, or yeah. there are problems um so a good a good good thing is that i'm building it for myself first i want skin in the game i'm going to sell my merchandise on there i'm going to sell wo music up there i'm going to move you know i'm not going to get rid of my bandcamp page but uh, because there's there's really no reason to, but I am going to prioritize well on Apple. So goal was launch merchandise, sell some stuff, prove that it works. Launch digital audio, prove that it works. Um, expand it so that we can let some other people in, uh, my other people in my bands, um, prove that that works. And then gradually just sort of expand the audience drawing initially from my own network and reach a point where we can say, yes, we can handle, you know, X thousand additional users, you know, send out invitations to however many thousand people. Mm. Um, so that, that was the plan. Uh, and then we were planning on announcing when we had something to show for it. I really don't like, you know, there are uh, in a lot of ways I'm kind of bad at social media. I don't like posting things unless I have something to say. I don't like playing the engagement game. You see a lot of bands, a lot of underground bands that are, you know, trying to try to encourage that constant engagement and keep people around. And it's like, remember when we did this, remember this, which I'm not going to tell anybody else, anybody how to conduct themselves or handle their band and people, people like that. Just, just be happy. Be cool. It's fine. Yeah. But I don't, I don't want to post unless I have something that I think is meaningful or interesting to say. And I I am not and was not comfortable announcing this product when I had so little to show for myself. I mm. want to, I, I don't like over promising. Uh, so I didn't want to announce anything publicly 
for Ampwall until it was further along. I wanted the bands to speak for it. So I wanted it to be like, hey, Woe has a new merch store. Woe is selling digital audio. These other bands are selling stuff. And if somebody happens to go to the homepage and, and reads about it, they can. And if people want to spread it, they can. But I wasn't pr- I wasn't planning on doing any kind of marketing or, or announcement or anything like that until we were further along. So obviously the Bandcamp situation changed that. And that yeah. was why we chose to announce early. Th- there was a lot of anxiety. You know, people were really freaking out about the sale. And, you know, I decided to, to really seize that moment because I, I, it, it was part of the discussion, right? It was, there was a discussion happening about what comes after Bandcamp. So I was like, here, maybe this comes after Bandcamp. Um, but in terms of, in terms of dates, so how does that change things for us? The only thing it really changes is now I have way too many emails hitting me and I'm, <laughs> I have way too much, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's sped up some of the conversations that we're having about fundraising. It's sped, it's forcing us to get a little bit more organized and pro a little bit sooner. Um, I always planned on having John join or, you know, trying to strong arm him into joining, but uh, we had to have that conversation out of nowhere. I called him up on a Friday and I was like, Hey man, I, I need your help. Like this is, this is serious. So, so that's, it's moved up a lot of our, our communication moved up how public we are in a lot of ways it's changed the 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 intensity of the uh the feedback we're getting but it's still crucial that we not release anything until it's ready it's Mm. still there's the benefit of launching too early because we feel pressured you know if we fuck that up it's that's game over and i don't want to do that to us and i especially don't want to do that to the people who are trusting us with their music Mm. with their art uh the most important thing is I, i I, I couldn't live with myself if I if I let down the people who were who were counting on us. So we're looking at uh, we're, we're probably looking at alpha tests with some bands that I'm not in by the end of the year, and then we're going to see how that goes. And if things go well, we want to start opening it up to people who we don't personally know early in the new year. So you know, there's a lot that can happen between now and then. Uh, we could find that the product is more stable and more ready than we think. We could find that there is more work to be done and that some of the problems are harder than we anticipated and we need more time. But we'll get there. We'll get there. This is what I've done professionally for for a long time. Now. I was just about to say, you're also yeah. you, you, you're not fresh out of college. So you, <laughs> you've <laughs> no. been through the cycle with other products. Yeah. You know, yes. you know the pitfalls yes. and the perils and things like that. So you, 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 you know what to look out for. Um, I do. You mentioned, uh, so, sorry, you were going to say? I know. I mean, I was just echoing back. Yeah, I, I do. It's not my first rodeo, but at the same time, one of the one of the truths of, of software product development early on is that you don't know what you don't know. And yeah. things that you anticipate, you know, I, if I anticipate a dozen problems, you know, I, or I anticipate five problems. I'm going to find that if I'm lucky, three or four of them are the problems that I expected. And the last one or two, I'm going to find they are not the problems I expected, or they go much deeper, or they, in the course of doing those, I discover five more problems. Yeah. And so things can go off the rails quickly and in surprising ways. And uh, that's, that's what makes this fun. I, I live for this. But you know, you just you just got to be be ready to get in there and shovel some shit. You know, you you mentioned earlier about uh, functionality that you would like to see in Bandcamp that you hadn't seen before. Um, can you expand on that? You know, I I can. I was about to say I, without giving away any unique <laughs> setting points that you might have built into Bandcamp. I'm uh, t- to be honest, I'm I'm less concerned with giving away unique selling points and more concerned with over promising things that I haven't fully vetted. Mm. I you know this this goes back to what I was saying about how I don't like to advertise things before they're ready. I have there are a lot of ideas that I have for just embracing a more of some of the community aspects of independent music. Um, and ways that I think the just the, the interface and the shopping experience and the tools provided to artists after you've sold could be a lot better. Mm. Um, 
but I have a lot of ideas swirling around in my head and a lot of leads that I need to chase down before I really feel comfortable because I don't, I don't want to be on the record. You know, yeah. you say, you say something one time and somebody shows up and they're like, I say, this is a standing said, record of everything you'll, you'll day. ever, you'll ever do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, especially on man, like the, the list of the list of people who've said shit on podcasts that comes back to haunt them is uh the big list so I, yeah. I don't i do not want to be another one of those people so uh you know i hope you'll you'll understand if i no 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 I, totally no i i was it, it's it's i asked it out of curiosity more than anything else course. the other thing that I, I i ask out of curiosity because i've had some personal experience of um uh, of 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 kind of being involved in assessing uh, companies that are going through the fundraising process, uh, a company that I used to work for a fair few years back, uh, they had a startup accelerator similar to Y Combinator or something like that. So I I used to every single year when they did their intake, it was me who was designing like the assessment for the businesses, the assessment for the. Uh, we, like you would have like obviously a financial assessment and then you would have an assessment of the of the founders so the founder assessment is what i would what i would design and what i would typically oversee um so have you started to to go down that road yet where you're starting to do fundraising or are you pitching the business to, to potential investors we we are yeah we are in a in a very i'd say kind of relaxed sort of way you know it's a it's a it feels like a kind of uh, a touchy subject because I think right now everybody is really sensitive to the idea of capital infecting independent music. And it's, I mean, it's, it's always been a problem. You know, people have been getting called sellouts and ostracized for, from their, their scenes for it for a long time, but it's especially relevant right now with what we're seeing with Bandcamp. It's, also been relevant i mean a big motivator for me was seeing what was happening with reddit the way reddit was you know cutting api access or seeing it with with twitter the way uh, you know that that has changed and so you know so i want to i want to clarify you know, that their fundraising can mean a lot of different things and it does not yeah. necessarily you you know this but a lot of you know, most of most of the people listening might not know that fundraising does not necessarily mean that I go out and I sit down with some Saudi Saudi oil prints and I'm like, you know, <laughs> he's, he's like, it's like, you know, here's a pile of money. And I'm yeah. like, Don't ask where we got it. Um, you know, it, you're gonna have it, to take this band off, this band off, this band off. Yeah, it's like, I mean, you know, it doesn't it it doesn't mean getting in bed with uh with with some you know real fucked up characters um in our case it does mean that we're talking with you know interested individuals who want to support what we're doing who have found themselves in positions where they can they can help out uh mm -hmm. sounds real fucking like like a lawyer wrote that doesn't it um you know, I, so, so yeah, but we, we put, we put together a little deck where we've taken a few calls. Um, we're talking to some friends. One of, one of the things we're, we're, we're but we're taking some safeguards against it. The, um, the first is, and the most, probably the most important is, uh, in, in the United States, when you register a business and, you know, I'm sure you probably know more about this than me, uh, but, uh, you, you incorporate in a, in a state. And every mm. state has different governing laws. Most tech companies, most startups incorporate in Delaware because Delaware has a lot of laws about corporate governance and that, and I guess, and taxation that just make it friendly to businesses. Um, when you incorporate in Delaware, you can register as something called a, um, a, a, a public benefit company or a public benefit corporation, which is a designation of a for-profit company. So a for-profit company, corporation, C-Corp, um, legally, the people in charge of the company can only pursue profit. It's the only thing they are allowed to prioritize. Mm. And if you refuse to prioritize profit, you know, if, if some Saudi oil baron comes out and wants to buy your company and they're making a good offer, you are obligated to consider it if it's good for the shareholders. Um, this leads us to, to, to some, some, you know, good outcomes economically. For, for people, but you know, not necessarily good outcomes for the arts. Uh, when you register as a, as a PBC, you 
in your incorporation, you add in what is essentially a mission statement, where it's a societal, a benefit to society. And at that point, you are legally obligated to consider and weigh the value to society as you've defined it against against shareholder value, mm. which means that you know it, it means that a PBC can choose to donate a lot of money, or they can refuse to increase prices, or they can you know make various business decisions that would not necessarily increase shareholder value because they the company agrees from day one that providing a value to society is equally important uh, and at times is more important than shareholder value. Um, yeah. So Ampwall, Ampwall is registered as a PPC, um, incorporated as a PPC. So from day one, there are these limitations on what we can do in pursuit of profit. And that I'm hoping is, you know, that's, that's, that's quite a, quite a, a weapon to wield when we're talking to potential investors, because it lets them know from day one that like, look, we're a for-profit company, you know, we're going to pursue ways to, 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 to function as a, as a thriving business. We, we want to succeed in the market. We also think that there is a very high value in preserving the arts, protecting the arts. And we are, you know, we're committed to that alongside everything else we're doing. So um, yeah, you know, we're, we're talking, trying to raise some money um, with that in mind. And uh, hopefully it keeps some of the more predatory folks away and encourages more like-minded uh, investors to, to, to get Yeah, I was about to say, so you, you, you're targeting a very specific kind of investor. But I mean, I think one thing that folks, you know, should pretend, well, I mean, I'm sure they, they, they potential investors would understand. I think for context for people listening to this, Bandcamp made more money than Spotify. Um, there's actually a, an article on Fast Company um, going back to our, uh, earlier this month, sp specifically talking about the fact that they make more money than Spotify. Um, so they, 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 there's definitely a there's a there's an opportunity in it commercially for anybody. There is, um, but I, I I I very much respect the fact that you've put safeguards in place to make sure that whatever commercial opportunity there is, it doesn't become the sole focus of the uh, right. of the service. That's kind That's of an right. ancillary benefit to providing something that everyone wants and that every that you know that serves the common good. That's right. That's right. And Bandcamp sang that song for a really long time. You know that was Bandcamp's mission, and they the the staff that built up the company and the the, the community that emerged around it really believed in that, and they all believed in it up until they sold the Epic Games for you know some hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and then they kept believing it until it was, you know, sold again. And my hope is that being a PBC will put some safeguards on some, you know, future leadership, some future board, some investor pressure, some outside force, or maybe inside forces that want to sell out the people. Um, it is, you know, uh, I, I, it's it's very important to me that. That the mission is, you know, we 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 exist to support underground music. That is mm. that is what we do. And if we can make some money along the way, fucking awesome. But um, we exist to support underground music. So when Epic Games comes comes around and they say, "Here's two hundred million. We 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 want uh, we want some of that amp ball love." Epic Games are we we thanks, but no thanks. No no thank <laughs> you. You can. Uh, you know, no. Uh, so two 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 hundred million though, mate, is a lot of money. It's a lot of money, but you know, uh, if if the press is to be believed, like you said, they were making a lot of money. They were making mm. a lot of fucking money. And I, if the press is to be believed, I have a very hard time believing that the founders weren't already doing well, that the investors weren't already doing well, and I am. Again, I am not against people making money. I'm not against people profiting and, and, and making investments and doing well. I do think that you shouldn't, if you have to choose between doing well and screwing over the arts and screwing over your supporters, you're, mm. you're doing something wrong. You're doing something wrong. And I, I want to believe that there's, there's a way to do, to do this ethically. 
And yeah, I agree. so, you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is here. The thing is also, you know, if you do that and you try and start another business, people will never trust you ever again. So if you if you try and you know you try and go fall back to because the argument could be okay I'm going to sell it for two hundred million or three hundred million I don't know the, the the price they sold it to Epic for we're going to sell it for say for argument's sake three hundred million and then I'm going to take some of that money and I'm going to start a new company that's exactly like Bandcamp people won't trust you because they'll go well you, you know you've already sold out once you know are, are you going to sell out again. Myself, if I were in those shoes, I'd go fuck it. Three hundred million, I'm going to retire. <laughs> and absolutely, I mean, look, like I, no one's ever offered me three hundred million dollars. You know, oh. I, I, I can't. I don't know what the situations were, and it's really easy for me to be like, you know, band camp. You shouldn't have taken that payday, but they they did it a long time. I'm sure the founders. I don't know what their situation is. Um, I don't know what the situation is. I don't know what promises they made to investors. I don't know who was was demanding their their exit. Um, I there's no I can't speculate, but I do know that I I don't want to be I don't want to be in that in that position. Uh, and I hope that the PBC um, by by starting as a public benefit corporation we we start on a footing that leads to to uh to a better outcome for independent music the thing is also because of the scene that you come from you know you 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 clearly have a great love for it so the 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 ethics and the um the ideals of that scene stick with you and you know the at the end of the day you 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 get to a certain point of success where money just becomes a number you know i i know a couple of people that are that are in that in that league and they will all say the same thing like at some point money is just a number i don't really care anymore about what's in my bank account i don't live day to day um yeah so i i think to be able to be in that spot is the absolute ideal for 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 you guys and you know it's it sounds like the the idea that you've got is is absolutely sensational but um i want to talk because i know we've got we're limited for time i want to talk about legacies of frailty because in amidst all of this You've gone and also recorded. Kind of, you, you you've gone and recorded. <laughs> really, one uh, you know for me a, a top thirty contender for twenty twenty three without a shadow of a doubt. Thank you. Um, and you've done it without the support. Um, and you 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 need to fill the blanks in here for me a little bit. But I got into woe through hope attrition. Hope attrition. Okay. You know the 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 it it. My understanding is it was a full band that recorded on that. Yeah, that's been scaled back, and Legacies of Frailty is, is really just you and Lev once again. Um, tell me a bit about the, the the making of the album, and you know, at at what point during the uh, apparently twenty four hours that you work every single day, <laughs> did you find the time <laughs> to put any focus on this? Because I mean, it's 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 a I mentioned it on on last week's episode. It's a very beautifully crafted record. It's a it's a record where you can hear a tremendous amount of work has gone into every single song. It's not just some guy sitting there going, "Okay, I'm going to play fast, scream, and just play crazy riffs over it." And there we go, album. Nothing wrong with that. I, uh, Battles of the yeah, North is one of my favorite albums ever. But yep. So uh, yeah, man. No, thank you for saying that. So so uh, okay. So you know, whoa. Go back again. Started it in 2006, 2007 as a solo project. Did everything. I did everything on the first album. Um, after the first album, we got offers to play live and put together a band. And then uh, I continued writing all of the songs and demoing everything. So I have demos with drums, with drum machine, past the first album, uh, for everything past that, including Hope Attrition. So uh, the band played on it with varying levels of contribution. Some songs would just be me just filling up and be like, here's the song, let's do it. And then others guys would come in and, and change little things here and there and add some personality to it. And uh, we did have a song in the third album that, that our, our drummer wrote. But um, Hope Attrition again uh, was, I demoed everything. Then we got together with the band, taught everybody the songs, a couple little things changed. And I think the guys have some writing credits on the songs and, we recorded um, Vendetta. We got hooked up with Vendetta Records for that one. They did that album, and uh, that was my first time working with them. Through uh, Ralph from Ulta, put me in touch mm-hmm. with Stefan. He also did a vinyl re-release of the first Woe well album, um, which was which was pretty nice. Ralph, so then, in- oh, incredibly highly of you, by the way. Uh, um, I think incredibly I, highly of him. 
Yeah, I, I I don't think I've ever spoken to him on the podcast or outside of the podcast where he hasn't mentioned Woe. Oh, so, uh, yeah, he, he, he thinks extraordinarily highly of you. I'm actually talking to him tomorrow. I've got him and Mike on for another episode that we're doing. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. So, uh, but but it was it, 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 it's cool the amount of love that he has for you guys. And I really like oh. the the stable of black metal bands that Vendetta Records are pulling together because I fucking adore all the... I think Woe is a perfect fit into that. You know, there there are some really really cool bands on 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 that label, playing in the style that you and Ulther dabble in. Yep. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And you know, so we. It's funny you mentioned before you talked about you've talked to bands who want to stay on indie labels. Um, we've turned down contracts. We have turned down contracts from 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 good labels that were, I guess, very reasonable contracts because we. I want to own my masters. I don't mm. want to give up the control. I want to sell directly. We did two albums with Candlelight Records, um, and those albums are not on Bandcamp. They're not on Ampwall. They're they are, you know, just sort of in the mist somewhere. Um, and it's a it's a really sad situation there that that we're we're working to to resolve, but. It's like uh, it. a lot of the bands that were on Eric Records in the in the in, yep. in the glory oh. days of Eric Records, you can't find their stuff anywhere. As a result, yep. Yep. Um, which is just uh, absolutely insane. Criminal, criminal, yeah. criminal. Yeah. You're talking about, you know, we're so overwhelmed with new music and there's new shit hitting us constantly, but we forget that every one of these albums ref is the result of countless hours and energy and effort and passion from real people who are probably losing money and losing sleep and beating up their bodies and disappointing their partners to, to create, and, you know, disappointing their parents and embarrassing their kids, you know, and, it, you know, to, to, to hold on to somebody's art is, uh, is a, is a, is a horrible thing. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Yeah. And uh, so, but but you know, and I don't think that every label that offers contracts and operates in that system is intending to withhold people's art. But uh, it, it inevitably happens sometimes. So Vendetta Records is the antidote to all of that. Stefan is he is a passionate underground, the true underground metal champion. He he believes in it. I can't tell you how many times I'll send him a message and be like, "Hey, man." I'm thinking about doing this thing with, with the album or with Whoa. What do you think? And he'll say, I don't know. It's your music. Do what you think is right. I support you. Every time. Every time. Mm. No matter what I say, it's your music. I support whatever you want to do. We were talking about the press releases for the album. And we, we looked at the press release and he said, hey, I see you have the Vendetta Records Bandcamp page in there. Put Woe's Bandcamp page instead. Like, he's uh, the most the most supportive legit legit uh guy when it when it comes to this and uh you know i feel i feel so lucky that i got to do a second well third fourth fourth release with him because he did uh he did the re-release and he did hope attrition and then an ep after it and now and now legacies it it, it kind of gives me hope when i hear stuff like that because you know we we, we live in an awfully commoditized world and in a, a, a world where you know value as a Value as a perception is it feels very fluid, and yep. so when you when you get to the, the the metal scene and you hear about, I mean, I, I know of one particular label right now that's going under, uh, headed up by somebody particularly you know like particularly well established in the scene. I, I'll I'll mention the name to you off off air, but I mean, this is a person that's that's been there, done that. They've they've been successful. The, la the 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 label's going under, but I I think the reason the label's going under is because there wasn't that that passion for what for what they were for what you know they didn't have the passion that they had when they set out in the in the in the scene initially. And I, for, for whatever reason, I feel like if I look at the labels that are thriving and I look at the bands that are thriving, I I really do feel the one bit of faith I have in maybe society as a whole is I see in the metal scene because I see the bands that are doing really well and the bands that are really kind of rising and maybe it's just within the orbit that I'm in, but the bands that are really kind of rising to the top are bands that have that passion labels that have that passion. And uh, it, it, it feels like folks can sniff out that authenticity. I think so. I think so. I mean, I think there's, 
there's a lot to be said for operating in a scene where no one no one who starts playing extreme metal thinks they're going to make it. You know, no. no one who's doing it. If you start playing black metal or death metal and you think that you're doing it to, to, to have a job, you're probably going to dis be disappointed. So who does that leave you with? It leaves you with, you know, may maybe some people who just sort of like, you know, they, they release some stuff. It's a hobby for them. But the people who stick with it, the people who invest in it are doing it probably because they love it. Mm. Probably because it's it's part of their their soul, part of you know if such a thing existed, like part of part of their identity, part of their DNA, where they just they just have to do it. Like I I have to make extreme music. It is it's it's the only thing that comes out of me when I when I play an instrument. It's uh you know it's been part of me since I was a kid. It's the only thing that I <laughs> the only thing I have to contribute. Mm. Uh, so and and with with labels like Vendetta, um, with a lot of, you know more of the underground uh, extreme metal labels, we see that passion for creation and and destruction and and, and intensity. Um, so yeah, man, it's uh, it's 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 real. Um, but uh, so legacies of frailty, we we talked about hope attrition. So legacies, um, I started writing the album over. I guess early on in COVID days, which is pretty intense in New York, and a lot of time at home. Yeah. Um, started writing then. Take always takes me a, a lot of time to write, but this was this was a little extra. And and as time went on, I was writing more and more of the music, and I, I demo everything with the computer with the drum machine. I do full songs except for vocals at home. Uh, I started spending more and more time with this music and getting more like just like deeper and crazier and weirder about it you know or it's like just like real like fucking howard hughes just like like you know in home at home with like long nails and not washed and like these riffs are perfect you know and um it it's a lot it's a i'm a lot i'm a lot to deal with and it it started to become clear to the guys that the 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 level of intensity of the music with my connection to it and then the, the details and the nuances and just the way it was going. I had a very different relationship with the material than everybody else did. And at best, the best we could hope for at that point was everybody would learn it and maybe do as good of a job carry, you know, capture what I could capture. I don't want to say good job, but you know, at best they would try to imitate what I was doing. And I would just be sitting there, you know, being like, you played that for, you know, one, 16th note too long you know like it needs to be an upstroke like no one needs that so we decided i would do all of the uh the, the instrumentation and then i wrote everything with levin drums with levin mind but sort of the same thing happened lev and i we were rehearsing the material we got i mean we we were we were ready to go and we decided kind of last minute that i had a, my drumming I had a better, like a different relationship, a more intense relationship with the music that he did. And the, the most, uh, the most respectful to the material way of performing it would be for me to perform all the drums with, uh, and then I insisted there were three sections of three songs that Lev and I had written together where we changed my demos and he contributed parts. So Lev, jumps on drums for about a minute and a half of music uh that's oh wow so uh, yeah so i'm up. just i'm just looking at metal archives now so he's only on the first third and fourth track yes and he's at the end of the third song the last like 60 seconds he's on 30 seconds of the i don't know like 15 20 seconds of the second or third song and then the very end of the fourth song mm. um and those are it's unusual, you know, you don't usually think of like an album where a different drummer plays for one riff, uh, but we, that's how the songs were created. And those mm -hmm. parts have Lev's style and fingerprints all over them. And I couldn't have played his parts correctly or with the, the, the spirit and the intensity that, yeah. so Lev, um, yeah, so Lev Lev jumps in for the ends of those songs, or the you know the end of the first song, uh, the the kind of spacey quiet parts of the 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 third song, and then the very end of the fourth song. Mm. 
And then besides that, it's all new. Where did this uh, multi-instrumentalist get his start? Like, what was the first instrument that you picked up? So I picked up guitar when I was 11, maybe 12. My, my mom was a guitarist and my dad is a musician. He was a jazz musician and, and classical guy. And so I was always just exposed to them playing music or listening to music or creating music. My dad is an artist. So he was always drawing or painting or doing weird abstract stuff. And so the idea of expressing yourself through music was just a very natural natural thing and then so i started playing guitar i learned on my mom's uh my mom's classical guitar um and then in high school you know very classic way somebody becomes a drummer you got a bunch of friends everybody plays guitar nobody's a drummer they're like chris you gotta you gotta play drums okay i'm gonna play drums and uh so i got drums but around that time so that was i was maybe 14 at the time I started really taking an interest in, um, I, I loved the idea of recording myself and writing my own songs and just Mm. not having to depend on anyone. So I always had this this vision of me just doing all pieces. And then, uh, over time, you know, I, I, for a long time, I didn't have a guitar. I was just a drummer and I, I, I never, I was at the time I wasn't very good at drums, but it was what I did. And then, um, Sometime before I started, whoa, I got a guitar again and felt a little, I was feeling a little frustrated by the being, the experience of being in a band. I wanted, I had ideas for, I wanted to be like this and, you know, I, I, I didn't want to compromise. Uh, I wanted to just sort of be unrestrained and free to just create uh, without any boundaries that I hadn't imposed for myself. And, you know, so solo project uh, was the way to go. And back back when I started Woe in particular, solo projects, I mean, there, black metal has a, a pretty unique history of solo projects. Yeah. Um, I think compared to a lot of other forms of music. And you see them, I mean, you see them everywhere. But black metal, uh, you know, you, you, you think of a band like Zaster or Leviathan in particular, um, where you you just have one weird dude who's who doesn't want to play well with others and they create this incredible art and they they don't allow themselves to be limited and i uh, i always really respected that mm. um and wanted to to just i just didn't see any reason why i why i wouldn't why i couldn't um yeah so and then over time i i've gone back and forth between focusing on different instruments so high school, I was really into playing drums. Uh, then with Woe, I, I was doing a little bit of both. I, I had a grindcore band where I was just drumming um, with uh, Steve from Crypt Sermon and Daeva called Unrest, and Brooks from Crypt Sermon as well. Yeah. Um, for a long time with Woe, I didn't have drums. I didn't play drums for years. I was just playing guitar. And then when uh, Matt, who's in Woe with me, uh, when we started uh, the band that would become Glorious Depravity, it just was natural for me to drum. And ever since then, I've been just drumming in a death metal band. And, uh, and I think you can probably hear a lot of that death metal influence. You know, the experience of playing Inglorious Depravity has had a huge impact on Woe. Um, you know, you can hear it through a lot of the, 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 the blast beat decisions, a lot of the, the vocals, especially. Yeah, you can um, definitely you can definitely hear some of that on Legacy, Legacies of Frailty. And as I said, like Legacies of Frailty to me is such a natural coming together of American black metal, second wave Norwegian black metal. You hear the death metal elements to it. And, you know, you even hear stuff that's a little further afield. So things like Akrakaka, you can hear little touches of. It's a, it's, it's a really, really kind of... In, in in a weird way, it's almost it feels like a love letter to everything that you that you enjoy and that inspires you, but through your through the prism of your own voice. Thank you, man. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I've um yeah, you know, over the years I've had different influences sort of come and go and I've I've set different expectations and different boundaries for for woe's music. And I've sort of recalibrated my goals for the project as I've just, as my tastes have evolved and just as I've evolved just as a person. 
with Legacies of Frailty, I, I really wanted to narrow the influences to just you know the core black metal that I that I love that that uh, as well as what I what I like to think of as Woe's voice, you know the 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 sound that I've defined over the years, which is you know essentially just like a raw melodic black metal uh, mm-hmm. with too many blast beats, and uh, yeah, I mean it is it is I am just as Ampwall is a product that I am building for myself. Woe is a band that I am playing for myself with the mm-hmm. music that I want to hear. Um, so I mean you know you can you, you, a, a lot, it's. Uh, the, the the people who listen to a lot of the same music as I do, they tend to pick out influences and be like, Oh, you really like Dawn. You really like Dawn from Sweden, don't mm. you? Like and I was like, Yeah, Slaughter Sun is literally probably my favorite album. Um, you know, you really like Over, don't you? Yeah, I really fucking like Nat and Smatrigal. Um and you know, things like that. And I I try to I try to avoid, you know, I know I just called out two very specific examples, but in general I try to avoid wearing my influences on my sleeves. I try to, you know, if, if you ask me, if we went riff by riff, I could, I could sort of tell you why riffs are there. And if I was forced to at gunpoint, I could say like, well, this probably is derived from this scene, you know, mm. but I try to keep it, I try to keep it narrowly scoped and uh, focused. I think what works though, is that you, you have a taste for the violent stuff as well though, because I, I see yeah. you wearing a Gravesend uh, long sleeve. And uh, yep. I, I I was absolutely blown away by those tracks that they put out ahead of. I think the new album is coming out tomorrow, Ooh. if I'm not mistaken. It's Just fucking good. Beastly, Dude. beastly Beastly music. So I'm going to name drop George, their drummer, is a very good friend of mine, and he's in Glorious Depravity with me. Um, oh, wow. And yeah, yeah. So Glorious Depravity, if you haven't checked it out, you should. Glorious Depravity is, so I'm on drums. Uh, Matt from Woe is on guitar. He had a band called Bellis for a long time. George from Gravesend is the drummer. Uh, he was in Mutilation Rights. Mm-hmm. Um, John is... I'm a big fan uh, of Mutilation Rights, actually. Great band. Great band. Mm-hmm. Their last album in particular. Oh, my God. Uh, George is the... we. He's the most incredible riff writer I've ever been in a room with. He He just riffs just appear you just describe a riff to him and it just appears it's incredible uh so john uh the bassist um he he's uh now in uh he's, he's playing in woe and he's doing ample with me and then doug uh our vocalist doug is in Piron, and he has a band called weeping sores and a band called sepidus and um he's yeah, just an incredibly amazing death metal vocalist incredible vocalist incredible performer um every one of the other guys bands are all worth checking out i i definitely will do and and by the way what a year it's been for death metal i mean i i'm I'm my mind is still blown by the fact that we got in the space of a single month cryptopsy dying fetus and cannibal corpse dropping albums all in this all at the same time and it's some of the best stuff they've put out in years all of them I, I haven't been this obsessed with a dying fetus album since destroy the opposition. Yeah. I, um, which is my favorite drum performance probably of all time, but, uh, it, it's an, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. How, how, how do they keep getting better? How do they keep like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. They, these guys should all be old and washed up at this <laughs> point. And they're, they're literally putting out some of the best work of their careers. It's, yeah, I it's agree. so it's, I hope that I can be doing music that is half as powerful as theirs when my, you know, when woe is as far along in the career as their, theirs are. John Gallagher is, is on steroids. There, there must be something because there's, must be. there is so much testosterone that is in that music, like especially on this new album. I mean, it is, it's a literally testosterone turned into it's literally is it's, fucking insane. It's you, you, you put it on and you're lifting and it's just like PR. PR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know so tell me something um, what, what are the touring plans for for woe over the uh you know now that the album is out and you know people are starting yeah. to digest it and and i've i've seen a lot of the response to it is very positive as well which must be great yeah um so we're <laughs> we were supposed to start rehearsing again and then i uh started a business that uh 
that is going insane. So that's kind of fucking us up. But um, we're going to start rehearsing again soon. We are working on some uh, some Europe plans, actually. I think we oh, will really? have some stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think we'll have some stuff to announce hopefully soon. Um, we have, we have, uh, you know, nothing is done until, till I don't know, until we're on a plane, I guess, until we're on stage. Like, I don't, I won't believe it, but, uh, you know, and, and, um, we're chatting with, uh, some people who, you know, I think, and I'll, I'll tell you about that. Oh, you know, uh, after the fact, cause I, as we know, I don't want to overpromise things, but, uh, we are looking to return to Europe next year. We will inevitably probably do some shows in the United States as well. Uh, one benefit of being self-employed or unemployed, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, and working in underground music is that uh, I'm going to say that going on tour is part of my job now. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, Networking. Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm, this is part of the job. I've got, you know, so uh, I think, uh, I think you'll be you'll be seeing Woe um, sooner than later. Out your well, way. if uh, if I get to see you in the UK, I will be a very happy man, sir, and uh, we'd be absolutely fantastic to meet in person. So, hopefully, we can make that happen sooner rather than later. Hope so. Thank you very much for your time. Um, we will definitely speak again at some point soon, and and, and what a pleasure! I, I'm. I am very excited about Amp Wall and as I said to you, just absolutely love Legacies of Frailty. Thanks so much, man. This has been a blast. I've been uh, looking forward to this one for a while. And uh, thank you so much for the, for the time and the conversation. And Anytime. This is, this is awesome. Anytime. First, first of many. Hope so. Take care. See you, man. Bye-bye.
That was Distant Epitaphs by Woe of their fantastic new album Legacies of Frailty. It's available right now on Vendetta Records. Link to their band camp in the description to the podcast. Someday soon I will be saying a link to their amp wall in the description to the podcast. I was really, really energized and inspired by that conversation. I hope you guys were as well. And I'm going to post the link to amp wall's website in the description to the show as well. So head over there, sign up for the mailing list. And also, of course, make sure that you're showing Woe your love and support a big thank you to chris greek for his time uh, and hopefully he is going to be back on the podcast at some point again in the not too distant future time now for another new release roundup it's been a stacked couple of weeks as 2023 continues to be another banner year for heavy music one of the surprise drops of the last 12 months uh, has been plague of locusts by australia's premier sonic terrorists the amenta uh it is billed as an ep but it does exceed 40 minutes in length not that i am complaining uh and it pays tribute to the band's myriad influences so songs by everybody from Killing Joke to Diamanda Galas to My Dying Bride, even Alice in Chains receives the cover treatment year. Uh, and if the key to a successful cover is for a group to retain the core of what made that song great to begin with and then translate it into their own unique voice, then I do believe that the Amenta have more than met the brief uh, in this instance. That being said, what has me really excited about this release is the title track.
Plague of Locusts is the sole original cut from the album, and for me, it's a stunning evolution of the blueprint that elevated 2021's Revelator to the very top of my list of favorite albums that year. Um, if this is an indication of where the Amenta are headed on their next album, then I would not be surprised if they repeated that achievement. Um, it is completely and utterly sensational every man in the band is in peak form and i have to shout out kane cressel yeah i mean he's one of my favorite vocalists but i think he outdoes himself on this track um so i it you know if anything this album makes me even more excited about what uh, the amenta are going to be serving up next my only slight side gripe with uh, the the record as a whole with plague of locusts the album uh is that rather than covering war dance by killing joke they covered asteroid but yeah as, as, as you can imagine, that is very, very minor, especially in the face of the top-notch effort turned in by the guys. Plague of Locusts is out right now on Debu Mimorti Productions. I will post a link to their Bandcamp in the description to the podcast, and I will do that for everybody that I talk about, so head over there and show them your love and support. Next up, we have got Cult Burial with Reverie of the Malignant. When I first premiered the debut single off this record a couple of months ago, I did say that Cult Burial were, in my mind, one of the UK Underground's best kept secrets. Um, and I believe that Reverie of the Malignant proves that from bell to bell. Where Cult Burial's first album combined that dark, bleak atmosphere of Ulcerate with the, the sort of sonic chaos and dissonance of Death Spell Omega to great effect, on album number two, that union is the jumping off point uh, to a sound that has been fine-tuned in every respect and actually adds a lot of new and very welcome elements. There's a lot more melody, there's a lot more atmosphere. I would even go as far as to say there's a lot more groove and a lot more hooks now than they had previously as well. There is, however, no weak link to be found at any point uh, over the course of the seven tracks on offer, and from uh, as far as I'm concerned, the only question that you're going to be asking yourself at the end of this album is how the fuck Cult Burial remain unsigned? Next up, we've got Sulphur Eon with seven crowns and seven seals. That is available right now on Van Records. Seven Crowns and Seven Seals, of course, is the long-awaited follow-up to 2018's The Scythe of Cosmic Chaos. That album was very well received. Uh, it was brutal. It was atmospheric. It was uh, everything that you wanted from Tier 1 blackened death metal in 2018 when it was put out. But where the seven crowns and seven seals differs is that it tends to prioritize the atmospheric side of things and the blackened the 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 atmospheric black metal flourishes over the brutality and that proves to be a real masterstroke because songs like hammer from the howling void uh, and the yearning abyss devours us are really elevated over anything that this band has done before there's a greater maturity um there's a greater degree of engagement um you know and there's i would i would argue these songs tend to stick with you a lot longer certainly on the first five to ten listens which is around about how much or how many times i've listened to the album now than anything these guys have done previously on arcane cambrian sorcery sulfur eon even tipped their hats to blood aus nort a little bit amidst a flurry of just absolutely sensational riffing um there is also a really epic conclusion uh, by way of a song called beneath the ziggurats uh, and at the end of the day uh, if you've been following um, anything about this record or you've been you know you you are, are active on any social media most likely your metal friends have already been talking about this album being pretty high up on year-end best lists and it is tough to argue against that sentiment uh that being said 
Uh, the Germans are going to have some very stiff competition uh, in 2023, not least of all from Sladeer's new album, White Heart, which is a more than worthy successor to their 2018 record of the futile fires of man. Now, I will say right from the start, when I first spoke about the new Sladeer record on the News Rant, I had a bit of a moment of my own and I ripped into uh, Joseph Deegan's comments about the modern black metal scene being oversaturated pantomime. I think that is still a garbage statement, especially when you consider that, uh, you know, regardless of your stripe of, uh, of heaviness, you have been truly spoiled for choice this year. But that being said, I am more than happy to put our differences aside, especially when Joseph and his bandmates have delivered the goods in the way that Whiteheart has. Combining violent, really swirling black metal riffing with, in my view, one of the most on-point drumming performances I've heard all year, White Heart is a thoroughly memorable and captivating record from start to finish. The band do use atmospheric elements, uh, but they are deployed sparingly and always to devastating effect. Uh, and the levels of measured aggression that are injected into every one of this album's tracks uh, is reminiscent for me of the last uh, Miss Tearing album which I say as a massive um, sign of respect and a massive compliment. Uh, and year now for your own personal consideration is uh, Sledir with one of their new tracks, Wall of the Reptile.
You just listened to The Wall of the Reptile by Sledeer. It's off their brand new album, White Heart. It's available right now on Deborah Marotti Productions, and the link to their Bandcamp will be in the description to the podcast. So head over there, buy yourself some music, and let them know that in spite of the fact that I disagree with their views on modern black metal, old Jackson at Into the Necrosphere sent you all the same. Right now, if you were on the picket line when Dave Chappelle released his last comedy special, it might be time for you to get to step in because this is my weekly news rant. A roundabout for judgment. And hang them where the world can see. Our first port of call is metalstorm.net as per usual and the first headline grabbing my attention Kai Leach Calling have debuted a new single called Glittering Delusion. It says here a year and a half after the release of their debut long player black metal formation Kai Leach Calling unveil a new standalone track titled Glittering Delusion. The succinct track expands upon the ethereal post black metal found on the band's uh, 2022 debut Dreams of Fragmentation placing the mellifluous vocals of Chelsea Murphy atop a trance like barrage of melodic black metal futurism. Let's hear what it sounds like, folks. Now, folks, you'll recall that I had Kyle Leach calling on the podcast uh, when Dreams of Fragmentation came out. It goes without saying, I really enjoyed that record. Uh, they put it out on Deborah Mamorti in April last year. And I think part of what appealed to me about that record was the very cinematic quality to the songs. I told them when they were on the show that it reminded me a little bit of the movie Drive and of this the soundtrack to the movie Drive, but through a through a black metal voice. I think it also captured the atmosphere of urban isolation that you really can feel, I think particularly when you've lived in a city like uh, like London. Now, by contrast, my feelings towards the most recent Dawn of Ouroboros outing, uh, which I mentioned because it features two-thirds of Kylie's Calling, could not have been more diametrically opposed if Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez herself had written the lyrics and sung on the album. Uh, and I mention that because, to me, this sounds a lot more like an unreleased track from that album uh, and by the way, that that dawn of or that dawn of Ouroboros album, and, and it is a mouthful, which is why I just tripped over my words. It's called Velvet uh, Incandescence. So if you're desperate to check it out, uh, so you can see what I'm talking about, then uh, you can do yourself. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's going to be doing yourself a favor. That really depends on your on your point of view, but you you can check it out. Anyway, it sounds a lot more like an off cut from the rec the recording sessions for that than it does the Kylie's Calling debut. Uh, interestingly enough, it says here um, that Glittering Delusion was originally created for developer CD Projekt Red as part of a contest to write an original song for the game Cyberpunk 2077. I love Cyberpunk 2077. Um, I haven't played it yet since the Phantom Liberty expansion has come out, but uh, once I've broken my Elden Ring addiction, I'll give it a go. But... Um, Anyway, I'm gonna uh, let me let me pause there. Let's give it another sixty seconds and see if the song goes somewhere that uh, is uh, very far from where it is currently.
Now, look, I have to be fair here. Tony Thomas has proven himself to be a great songwriter in the past, and I usually really enjoy Chelsea Murphy's vocals, whether she is screaming or whether she's singing, but this track doesn't work for me on any level whatsoever. I don't think major chords belong in black metal. I've said this before. Uh, and as much talent as Chelsea has, and, and it, it is ample, uh, I feel her talent is a little misdirected on this track. So uh, I'm not sure whether the song was um, included on Cyberpunk. I can't recall hearing it. Uh, if it wasn't, I'm not surprised. Um, hopefully this isn't an indication of where they're going with uh, their next album I, I certainly wouldn't think so if it was just done as a as a one-off then you know so be it but it's it's not for me uh maybe if you like stuff like deaf heaven and, and bands like that this will this will appeal but uh i think you guys know my thoughts on that sort of thing uh anyway we move on satan's fall have revealed a new track called afterglow it says here finland's satan's fall are unveiling the afterglow single serving as a last taste prior to the release of their sophomore album destination destruction uh isa jusilla directed and uh, edited the accompanying music video clip that certainly creates a huge amount of anticipation to me so let's give this a spin <laughs> When you've been listening to metal for an extended period of time, and I know many of you are going to be able to relate to what I'm about to say, but you get to a point where you can hear a couple of bars of a song and you will know immediately what the rest of that song, sometimes the rest of the album is going to sound like. I got to that point with a lot of the melodic death metal stuff, as I've alluded to before on the show, which is partly why I wanted to stop uh, writing for Chronicles of Chaos, because I didn't want to feel obligated to review a bunch of shit that I didn't enjoy. Um, the that ability to predict what something is going to sound like you know after just hearing a few seconds of it is absolutely the case here because if I had to uh, if I had to map out a story in my mind that um, you know is is cropping up as soon as I hear this I would suggest one of the guys in this band clearly works or knows someone who works at the studio where Iron Maiden uh, maybe recorded a, a song or two in the past they got hold of a couple of scratch tracks uh, and that became the blueprint for this entire song um, it, 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 it actually doesn't sound it does sound like Iron Maiden but it also sounds like Steel Panther if they decided to uh, stop making jokes and take themselves too seriously uh minus 10 out of 10 that fucking sucks okay um let's uh let's move swiftly on um the next headline dimu borger announced covers album inspiratio profanus uh it says while waiting for inspiration to create new music dimu borger herald their 30-year legacy by releasing together for the first time a collection of their cover songs the album inspiratio profanus is being announced with the release of the first single black metal by the extreme metal pioneers venom the outing will be released on december the 8th via nuclear blast records if i go through that track list the word cash in or the words cash in immediately spring to mind because all of them have been on either special editions of albums or eps before black metal i know for example was on the the leather book version of insorted diaboli um burn in hell obviously you know that from puritanical euphoric misanthropia um i think it was it was on the special edition of that the rest, uh, I've, I think Nocturnal Fear was on the Devil's Path EP, 
But anyway, it says here, a statement from the band, message to you, the fans old and new. We thought we'd offer a little something while we are held up concocting new alchemic brews in our lab. So apparently they are now in the craft beer game as well as the pretend black metal game. Now, many of you uh, have these cuts in your possession already, but nevertheless, we figured it would be a good time to make some money off all the covers we've done over the years compiled under one release. We aptly chose Inspiratio Profanus as the title for this uh, purpose, and we hope you'll enjoy it as much as we do. Consider this a homage to some of the artists that have inspired us and still do, as well as a means to keep the drug dealers at bay to whom we owe money. Um, they've got black metal here. I know what this sounds like, I suspect many of you guys do as well, but uh, let's, let's give it a quick listen all the same. When I was talking earlier about the Amenta uh, EP, I said that the goal of a band, in my view, when they're covering a song, is to, to to capture the core of what made the song great, and then translate that into your own voice. And sometimes that means a song comes out sounding completely different, as has been the case with things like um, Black Sabbath, covered by Typo Negative, Let's Get Physical, covered by Revolting Cox. I think you can add Angry Chair by the Amenta to that. I think the, the cover they do of that particular track is fantastic. I think the worst thing that you can do as a band is when you record a cover treated like a glorified karaoke, and that, in my mind, is exactly what Dimmer Borger have done here. Um, I mean, it is so bad, it sounds like Shagrath literally phoned in the vocals back when they were doing this in, I think it was 2007. It's, it's just lazy. And, you know, as a side note, the, the fact they chose one of the most overrated songs in the Venom back catalogue and one that has been done to death by everyone from hypocrisy to Cradle of Filth isn't helping either. Uh, you know, as we go down the list there, um, I know the Satan My Master cover is a little bit better. I don't know why you would bother doing the Dead Men Don't Rape cover by, or that was originally done by GGFH, um, but Red Harvest covered that and did such a sensational job with it that that should really, that should really put you off even attempting to uh, do the same. I do quite like the Burn in Hell cover that they did. I think what they kind of, in a way, did exactly the opposite there to what they've done with um, uh, with Black Metal, which they actually did it in their own voice. It sounded unique. It sounded it sounded like a fresh take on a song that a lot of people know. And actually, that Nocturnal Fear uh, cover isn't bad either. The the Celtic Frost cover. But goddamn, man, you know, could they have uh, could they have stood to do just something a little bit different, or you know, add two new songs? that people haven't heard to justify making this an album um then again i guess many of their uh, most mind melted followers will end up buying this in any case you know in which case you know well done to you for wasting your fucking money all right a legion present inhumation single and it also says that their vocalist ezra haynes has returned to the band so it says yeah legion are pleased to announce the return of vocalist ezra haynes as a permanent member and concurrently release a brand new song inhumation uh, ezra was the original recording vocalist for a legion between 20 uh, 2008 and 2015 uh, and recorded the debut ep and first three full-length albums inhumation marks ezra's first recording with the legion since 2014's elements of the infinite. Uh, let's give it a listen.
So it says here, Greg Burgess states, it's been a complete blast having Ezra's creative and positive energy back in the band. We share so much history together. It feels like having one of your best friends back after a long absence. His creativeness and charisma. I don't think creativeness is a word. Anyway, his creativeness and charisma has been missed by many, uh, and it feels like we've picked uh, back up right where we left off. Am I 10 years younger now? Is this how magic works? Ezra has said this of Inhumation. We wanted to do a callback to the first album when we signed to Nuclear Blast. Sorry, to Metal Blade Records, uh, 2010's Fragments of Form and Function. Uh, for the second song on that, The Renewal, I built a layered vocal section that I thought was really neat then. Uh, I wanted to somehow incorporate something similar, but bigger and evolved uh, inhumation, considering the song is so damn massive. Uh, it's without a doubt the most aggressive thing I've ever written. Also, now that Allegiant is a group with three gents on vocals, I wanted to take advantage of that as well as showcase Michael's insane vocal talent. Um, I am a strong supporter of multiple vocalists in a band, as you all know. I am really liking what I'm hearing here so far, so let's get back to it. I remember a lot of hype around Allegion back in 2014 when Elements of the Infinite came out and for whatever reason, and I can't really put my finger on why, they were just never a band that, that stuck with me. Um, and I think it was maybe because there was a bunch of other releases coming out at the time that I was more interested in. But that said, this track may very, very well turn me into a full-blooded fan. I love literally everything that I've heard so far in the last two minutes and four seconds that opening riff first of all is filthy i love how it builds the tension leading up to that first blast beat and then when the blasting kicks in the way the discordance gives way to that really dark but kind of really simple melodic line is just absolutely superb and it helps set up those vocals perfectly um, and then on the topic of vocals you know i i can't recall ezra haynes sounding that good on any previous Allegiant records that I heard. Uh, you know, seething is the word that comes to mind. Uh, you know, he sounds fucking pissed off. He sounds convincing. Uh, and what I particularly love is that pacing and that rhythm in his voice. Uh, that is just completely and utterly on point. Um, let's give this another 60 seconds. fucking fantastic tell me what you guys think in the comments but that is unequivocally top-notch in my opinion well done to the gentleman from Allegion and uh welcome back Ezra Haynes I, I am very 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 excited about whatever these guys put out next that uh, that is absolutely brilliant um Speaking just of uh, comments, I want to say thank you very much to every single member of the Legion for the 
Um, I mean, the deluge of love and positivity that I got uh, when I posted episode 200. Obviously, very glad that you guys enjoyed the conversation that I had with Attila. Um, but uh, yeah, man, so many folks reached out to me to say, you know, how much the podcast means to them and how much they enjoy it and, you know, how appreciative they am of, or they are of everything that I do. Uh, and I just want to say thank you very much. It means the world to me that you guys feel that way. Uh, it certainly also makes me want to keep on doing this, um, you know, just take it to wherever it can it can go you know this is this podcast is a niche within a niche within a niche so i'm not ever i'm not under any illusions or do i have any ambitions to get you know millions of people listening to it i don't, I don't think that's actually possible you know based on based on how many of us there are and when i say niche within a niche within a niche like i mentioned to somebody the other day you you know you need to be into a certain strain of heavy music you then need to be open to the idea of long form conversation and you also need to be open to the idea of you know some uh, pretty freewheeling uh, opinions being thrown around on the podcast so the fact you guys are down with us and you love what i do uh, as i said it means the world to me and i'm very very excited about what 2024 is going to bring um all right uh next up we've got imperial triumphant who reveal a cover for Met uh, metallica's motor breath um, they've done the Dizzy Gillespie cover, which we know to be an absolute train wreck. Uh, and then, of course, they did the cover of Radiohead, which I initially thought was going to be a train wreck, but it turned out to be pretty surprising. So it says here, Imperial Triumphant have released a fourth music piece in their cover series this year. This time, the New York-based avant-garde uh, metal trio present their take on Metallica's Motor Breath. Uh, I'm very curious to hear what this is going to sound like. So uh, without further ado... So I think the opening jazz stuff that they did there is terrible. They should not have added that on the song at all. It's fucking awful. But actually when the song kicks in properly um, and you've got the, 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 the main motor breath riff uh, playing and then you've got the uh, like that, that clean guitar line going over it, that is fucking cool. I'm, I'm really liking that. And then those vocals sounding a little demented going over the main riff, I, I'm not hating that either. So uh, let's get back to it, folks. Imperial Triumphant are basically doing everything here with Motor Breath that Dimmu Borger didn't do with Black Metal in, in that they're reinterpreting or you could maybe say retelling a classic in their own voice and, and I think that for the most part they're doing it brilliantly. If I were producing, I'd have possibly suggested that in addition to that jazz nonsense at the beginning, um, they maybe don't color so far outside the lines on the chorus. I mean, the chorus sounds like basically like they're turned into a grindcore band. 
Um, so maybe just show a little bit more restraint there. Stick stick closer to the the, the, the main song. But other than that, I, I actually think this is super interesting. I, I'm sure the vast majority of people who think of Metallica as their favorite band will absolutely hate it. Um, although I, I'm also willing to bet that Metallica themselves w would actually disagree. Um, it reminds me of something else, actually. If you want to hear a stunning cover of a Metallica song, and I'm sure I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but make sure you listen to Dave uh, Gahan of Depeche Mode's cover of Nothing Else Matters. It's on that blackened tribute to the Black Album uh, release they put out, I think, a year or two ago. Um, that cover is extraordinary, in my opinion. And it, it is it, it betters the original by a quite significant margin. But as far as Imperial Triumphant is concerned, they've surprised me with their Radiohead cover. They've surprised me with this cover. Just, uh, you know, please, guys, no more no more Dizzy Gillespie. Save us. Save us from that shit. Uh, but this is, this is good. All right. Uh, let's move on. Um, as I'm looking for the next article, one other thing to mention, many of you asked me for a, uh, an update of the hi-fi episodes that I did, um, a couple of, yeah, probably now a couple of years ago. Like I said a while back, I, I don't think I'm going to do a f another full-blown hi-fi episode. Um, if you want to check out great hi-fi channels on YouTube, go check out my friend Terry Ellis. He's channel uh, pursuit of perfect system is superb but i will do at some point when i get around to it i'll record a, a like a just a quick youtube video with an update of what's on the hi-fi rack at the moment uh things have evolved quite substantially since the uh since the last hi-fi episode that i had on into the necrosphere and uh you know if you have any questions about maybe something that you're looking at buying you know i'm always open to that so feel free to reach out um just don't do what somebody did a while back and ask me for like a whole breakdown of what they should get and then i say to them okay this and this and this you know I, assuming they don't have a huge amount of money and then they say they've got two hundred dollars to spend and it's like okay i know with some folks times are tight but if you only have two hundred dollars to spend then perhaps hi-fi is is not for you Okay, uh, the next one catching my attention, Mortuary Drape present Rattle Breath track. It says here, Black Death Metal Ensemble Mortuary Drape have uh, premiered Rattle Breath, the first taste of their forthcoming new album, Black Mirror, which is due out on November the 3rd via Peaceful Records. The accompanying video clip has been created by Matthew Vickerstaff. Um, let's give this a listen. I know there's a lot of excitement from various members of the Legion over this one. I, I must confess, I've never been what you would call a mortuary drape diehard. Uh, you know, I had my dalliances with All the Witches Dance and Secret uh, Sudaria. I did really, really like uh, their 2014 album Spiritual Independence. But, you know, if I had to list my top uh, favorite black metal bands right now, I don't even think that mortuary drape would crack the top 100, let alone the top 50. Um, now, uh, I... So having said that uh i'm not hating this it's got a very uh, like classic rock feel to it but that's you know sort of been 
a mainstay with a lot of more tree drape uh, material. Uh, one thing that I will say this is a lot better at than Spiritual Independence is the is the mix and the recording. Um, I think Spiritual Independence was fantastic, and I mean it was very well received. I think it's their highest reviewed record on Metal Archives, but uh, the production lacked some dynamics and some low end punch, which I feel is very present here. Uh, also, from what I've seen so far, kudos to Matt Vickerstaff for the uh, the music video. I think he's done a fucking fantastic job of it. Uh, and that's not something that I say often on the news rant, so uh, you know it has to be good. Anyway, let's get back to it. One thing that I will say is as much as the production of the mix on this is is better than Spiritual Independence, one thing I feel is missing a little bit is the Spiritual Independence, every single track was soaked, for lack of a better word, in that occult, satanic, like cheesy satanic vibe, and I fucking love that. I, I thought Spiritual Independence was where they nailed that sound better than any of their previous records. I kind of feel it's a little bit missing, uh, yeah. This kind of maybe overemphasizes the classic rock influences, um, you know, at the expense of everything else. Um, so it's not a bad song, but it's not exactly rocketing up my list of uh, the, the most anticipated records between now and the end of the year. So yeah, not bad. I'm curious to hear what you guys think though, because as I said, I know a lot of people are uh, super excited about a new Mortuary Drape album. Um, and uh, if you're a fan of theirs, uh, you almost certainly have cause to be because this is the first thing they've put out in nearly 10 years. Um, okay, next up, we're going to listen to the Infernal Sea, who have debuted their Bastard of the East single. It says here, Bastard of the East uh, is the first official single from the Infernal Sea's upcoming full-length album, um, Hell Fenlick, uh, and it's premiered online uh, with an accompanying music video. The latter was crafted by Morgan Ted of Erase Creative, and the new outing comes out on January the 26th, 2024, via Candlelight Records. Uh, I'll let you guys in on a little secret, if memory serves me correctly. Jason Mendonca of Akukaka celebrates his birthday on January the 26th. Uh, so that could only be a good omen. Let's hear what Bastard of the East sounds like. God damn. I, I thought that Negotium Crucis, which Infernal Sea put out in 2020, was absolutely fantastic. And I thought it was a huge step forward for them creatively and musically. Everything I have heard in the minute 16 seconds of the clip we've just listened to so far suggests that they're basically taking every single element of what made that album great and they are amplifying it tenfold. Yeah. 
released. Defaulted to God. Answer my warning. My warning. My warning. I am the savior of the faith. The master of execution. Swathering in the night. The beast. The beast. That riff is fucking nasty. Uh, the hook is as infectious as a f bad case of the crabs. The groove is absolutely working for me. I love the reverb on those vocals. This is absolutely top, top notch. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to give it another 60 seconds. From Many, many, many thumbs up. And I'm excited about the fact that they're actually putting it out next year because, um, you know, this year the, the traffic is a little bit too heavy. And also January is such a dead month usually. It's nice when a band puts out something, uh, you know, in January that you know is going to kick ass. I mean, it it doesn't help them when it comes to year-end best list. I, I always feel like a lot of bands get overlooked when they put out stuff at the beginning of the year. This year, for example, you know, the concern is that Vothroch doesn't get the due, the, the, the due they are, or sorry, the, the desserts that they are due. Um, but, uh, that, you know, like I said, you, you kind of need something to get you going at the start of the year, and I will certainly be looking forward to this. Speaking of uh, the end of this year and the start of next year, uh, a reminder to you all to uh, get the Kleenex ready because I will be away from the, the last episode that i'm going to post is going to be posted on december the 5th uh and then i'm going to be out for uh the remainder of december and i will probably do my first episode on january 16th uh because i'm we, we're getting back from south africa we're flying to south africa on december the 8th coming back on january the 8th so i'll be away for a full month and i cannot fucking wait uh this has been a a hell of a year work wise um you know really pretty much everything everything in life has just been the intensity of it has just ramped up massively so i i cannot wait to uh, to have a bit of a break and uh, i'm gonna do very much the same thing that i did last year so we're headed off to a fantastic place called gondwana for a safari as soon as we get to south africa uh, we're going to be there for about three days. Then we're going to meet my bro Andre um, in the Eastern Cape. And uh, then it's back off to uh, Hermanus, which is near Cape Town. Uh, we're going to be chilling there, drinking a lot of wine, eating a lot of meat and living the good life. And hopefully celebrating a Springbok uh, World Back-to-Back -back World Cup win. Although I, I think that's a pretty tall order. So once again, indulge me. I know most of you guys don't give a flying fuck about rugby, but last night... In one of the most tense games in the history of tense games, it even eclipsed the France-South Africa game from the weekend previously. Uh, South Africa passed England by one point, thanks to the fact that we or our scrummaging was a little better than England. England beat us in every other facet of the game, but it was the one one thing that salvaged the game for us was our scrumming. We beat them by one point. We're through to the finals. We're playing the All Blacks uh, this coming Saturday. Uh, and uh, it is going to be a hell of a game. Um, I, I don't think that we're going to uh, beat the All Blacks, but in in fairness, I've got so much love and respect for the All Blacks if they do beat us. I think if you're going to if you're going to lose, 
that's probably not the worst um, the worst team to lose against. So we will see what happens. Uh, but like I said, fingers crossed. You know, there, there, there's still that outside chance that we may be celebrating a Springbok win when I uh, head over to uh, to South Africa in December. Um, okay, let's do one more on Metal Storm, and then we head over to the Democrats' guide to rock music. Crypta have revealed a new lyric video. It says, "Yeah, Death Metal Collective Crypta are presenting a brand new lyric video for Stronghold, a cut from their latest studio record, Shades of Sorrow." Uh, I've actually not really listened to that record much. I've listened to the singles they've released, but not spent a huge amount of time listening to crypto outside of that uh i know a lot of folks are very excited about them uh i suspect we all understand why but anyway let's hear what stronghold sounds like That's not bad. Uh, I think the the melody that is in that chorus is, is probably what's salvaging the song for me because up to that point, it's a bit pedestrian, but but that melody really brings everything together. Um, and it, it kind of makes you feel like maybe the rest of it will grow on you. Good vocals, good performances. Uh, it's not the best death metal album you're going to hear in 2023, as some would suggest, but uh, it is not bad at all. Okay, let's head over to the Democrats' guide to rock music, blabbermouth.net. Um, we've got uh, a news headline here with Nico McBrain saying he's uh, back to 85 to 90% strength. Um, I'm curious to hear what actually happened to him. So, yeah, he suffered a stroke in January. I'm sure we spoke about it, but... I must be perfectly honest, it actually slipped my mind that it had happened. Uh, it says here, during an appearance on Sirius XM's Trunk Nation Power Trip special, Iron Maiden's Nico McBrain discussed the band's ongoing The Future Past tour, which marks his first time hitting the road since he suffered a stroke earlier this year. Asked how the shows have been so far, Nico said, uh, it's going great, it started off a little shaky for me, but as time went on and the more shows we performed, uh, I started to get a little bit more strength and they've been really rocking out as well. And the last couple of months have been fantastic. The 71-year-old McBrain also talked about his recovery in more detail and touched upon how his health setback uh, affected his drumming. He said, I'm doing good right now. I'm still probably, I'd say, 85 to 90% back to strength, but I still have a little less dexterity with speed in my fingers. My fingers are the ones that uh, this is the last thing to strengthen up, but I had to change certain drum fills, some fills that everybody knows me for uh, on certain songs. I had to improvise those at rehearsals to be able to actually play the songs. I'm just glad the dude is back up and firing on, um, you know, most, most cylinders. Because to come back at the age of 71 from a stroke and you're going out on tour with a band playing the kind of music that Iron Maiden play, I mean, it's not Nile, but it's, it's, it's still reasonably intense. And uh, I mean, how many fucking 71 year olds do you know who've experienced a health event like that uh and are back out playing heavy metal so um kudos to him and i'm very very glad to see that he's uh that he's recovering and hopefully 85 to 90 percent accelerates to 100 percent very soon wasps blackie lawless on the importance of free speech i don't want to limit your ability to speak in a new interview with metal shop wasp frontman blackie lawless speaks about how he was affected by his experience with the pmrc uh, more than three and a half decades ago back in the mid 80s the pmrc published a list called the filthy 15 which uh, for many folks uh, became their shopping list 
<laughs> but it said uh, they or the the filthy 15 consisted of the top 15 songs they wanted to ban uh, due to objectionable lyrics suggesting violence sex drugs alcohol or the occult they petitioned for lyrics to be printed on the album jackets and no one was safe heavy metal acts were right there alongside the pop stars acdc madonna motley Crue, judas priest prince uh, wasp uh, Merciful Fate, Vanity, Def Leppard, Cindy Lauper, and Twisted Sister all made the Filthy 15 list. I swear to God, if it ever comes out that Twisted Sister paid to be on the list, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, in November 1985, the RIAA, uh, Recording Industry Association of America, put together the Parental Advisory Explicit Lyrics Label. Um, it was funny when Ice Cube was on the Joe Rogan experience, he actually spoke about that and, and said that the Parental Advisory sticker became such a an asset to 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 or like such a mark of honor for bands that they actually ended up making their own if they if the the album wasn't being tagged with it already because it, it meant that more people were going to buy your record but yeah just just the reason i say i wouldn't be surprised if twisted sister paid to be on that list like if you compare them to the other names on there like acdc you had hell's bells highway to hell hell, hell ain't a bad place to be you know they were there, there was like a a tongue-in-cheek element to acdc's music but you know they were they were they were still a band that you as especially after the whole richard ramirez malarkey they were a band that you know still felt dangerous um motley crew you know they they kind of remind me whenever i think of motley crew nowadays i think of uh bill burr's joke about how in the 80s we listened to music where men dressed like women and sang about the devil that was motley crew say what you will about them i i fucking hate their music but they they still had that element to them judas priest obviously had the whole issue with um the court case where somebody said that they uh you know had, had inspired somebody to commit suicide so that gave them a rep wasp was you know wasp and merciful fate you know they had don't, don't break the oath and all that stuff Def leopard I, I i don't quite get either but twisted sister i mean they were one of the most like undangerous bands one of the most i mean even by those those years standards there were bands that were way 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 worse i mean the fact that venom wasn't in there just shows you how out of touch the pmrc was but anyway um it says here we were too young to really understand what it was all about but they quickly put us in the eye of the hurricane and then all kinds of bad things started happening death threats and getting shot at and all that we became educated very very quickly i think i was in indiana uh, i think it was indianapolis this girl came to interview me and it was like 1987 she'd worked for the pmrc at one point and she at this time uh, i was talking to her was a journalist and she goes she brought in a cassette tape and she goes i've got something you need to hear and she played this cassette tape to me and on it was susan baker co-founder of the pmrc uh, and a few of the others talking about what their real motivation was and their motivation was not to get stickers on records their motivation was to get al gore a platform to run for president of the united states so they were trying to create a political profile for him because what better way to get attention if you're a political candidate a southern caricature which is what he was uh, what better way to get attention than to go after an attention getter? I mean, this is McCarthyism. You know, it's no different. Richard Nixon did it. All these witch hunts that went on in D.C. for years. Uh, but they come to a generation who's not heard it. You know, I I'm not going to bother going through the rest of the article, but I've spoken about it previously. This is very similar to a lot of the um, the, uh, the the bullshit. Let's, let's give it the, its scientific term the bullshit that we see floating around um you know uh, about various topics at the moment um you know people getting cancelled all over the show and a lot of it is politically inspired and it's people that want to grandstand um you know and get a bit of cop a bit of that um that attention for themselves you know we live in a we live in an attention economy and people are doing their best to cash in as much as they possibly can by going after people who they perceive to be you know uh against the narrative whatever that narrative is whether it's trans rights whether it's you know critical gender theory critical race theory uh whatever the case may be and uh, the truth just absolutely doesn't matter and the fact that it has infiltrated metal to the degree that it has makes me fucking sick to my stomach like i said to 
um, uh, Cheyenne when I was on Iblis Manifestations. You know, I've had a couple of folks on this podcast that I've gotten a little bit of stick about, not a lot. And I think that's because the Legion are relatively open minded and you guys know the, the place that I'm coming from uh, when it comes to talking to anybody. Um, you know, and you also know that my own personal thoughts on, you know, various things, including the topics that I've mentioned before. But one thing I found to be absolutely mind boggling was a guy that sent me a very nasty message about the fact that um, uh, when uh, Nas Alchemeth was on the podcast previously, we had spoken about Marxism and like he, I think, I think we'd used the phrase neo-Marxist and he's in his fucking my drug melted mind. That was a dog whistle for white supremacy. So we're now in a place where you can't even say I disagree with communism, I disagree with Marxism uh, for for one to being called a, a white supremacist. I mean, that is fucking insane. And and, and it, it proves what I've said many times about all of these things. They take, they co-opt these, these very touchy, very emotive subjects in order to weaponize them and use them against people that, uh, you know, are saying things that they don't like. Say something you don't like, immediately they connect it to whatever cause they're, they're running for, and then they go, well, you're a white supremacist. It's like um, uh, a couple of days ago, the Saint Greta Thunberg uh, had the whole, um, uh, you know, basically try to connect this, uh, you know, the Palestinian uh, Gaza liberation movement to climate change. And I mean, regardless of where you stand on that, that's just a that's a reach way too far. And then of course she got into trouble because she had the the whole octopus uh, on the photo with her, which is a anti-Semitic trope and blah blah blah. I'm not going to go into that, but yeah, it's it the, these people people need to understand these folks don't have principles. They 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 have the only principles they have are principles that are directly tied into whatever cause they're pushing, and that cause that they're pushing typically tends to benefit them financially or otherwise in this attention economy. And so they try and weaponize as much as they possibly can in order to get you to, to shut your mouth or at the very least count your words before you speak out against them. And it's fucking dangerous. It's a disgrace. And it's it, it, it indicates a flaw in people's character, in my opinion. Um, Exciter will eventually release new music. I'll be looking forward to that because I really like Exciter. Gorguts uh, to begin work on new album later this fall. Something else I'm looking forward to. Uh, Paul Stanley rules out a Kiss residency at Las Vegas' Sphere. I can't really see that happening. Don't really give a fuck. Uh, Metallica's Lars Ulrich on watching ACDC at Power Trip. I actually got a little misty-eyed a couple of times. I watched a couple of clips from uh, the Power Trip show that ACDC played. I mean, firstly, a hell of a set. They played all the hits there. Thunderstruck, Highway to Hell, Hell and a Bad Place to Be. You know, the, all of the guys really look like the years have caught up to them. You know, and I must be honest, it, it wasn't Brian Johnson's finest vocal performance, but I'm with Alan Avril on these things where you, you check out these guys and you go, it's years and years of hard touring, hard living, catching up to them. They deserve to go out on whatever terms they choose to go out. And if they're not playing at their best right now, count yourself lucky that you still got the opportunity to see them. I would love to see ACDC to this day. Uh, and I'm glad they the, the show at Power Trip seemed to be as um, as well received as it was. Speaking of uh, of old geezers, Duff McKagan, Axl Rose is a fucking master. It's ironic that he says that because I, I don't see any good music having come from Axl Rose for many, many years now. Um, certainly not since uh, User Illusion. But further down on the uh, list of headlines, Duff McKagan shares a music video for I Just Don't Know featuring Jerry Cantrell. Got to say, it's a million miles removed from the standard uh, Into the Necrosphere fair. But um, I really like the direction that Duff McKagan has taken his solo music. It's kind of like alt country acoustic stuff, um, but it's fucking fantastic. And I'm not going to listen to the song, but uh, you guys can go check it out for yourself if you're interested in that style of music. But that that track that um, is on that Blabbermouth article, I just don't know, featuring Jerry Cantrell of Alice in Chains is fucking sensational. Um, so, uh, you know, Duff calling Axel the master. I think it's ironic because Duff is the only one from Guns N' Roses putting out any music I'm remotely interested in at the moment. Uh, Dave Lombardo says Slayer was the best big four band. We really showed everyone else how it should be done. Um, 
I would agree with that. It says here, in a new interview with Metal Hammer, original Slayer drummer Dave Lombardo was asked which of the big bands, sorry, which of the bands in the big four of the 1980s thrash metal Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, and Anthrax was best. Uh, he responded without hesitation, Slayer. Who else could I pick? We were brutal, man. We were on top of our game, and if you watch the videos, we were on fire. We really showed everyone else how it should be done. We tore everyone a new one. Uh, there is no doubt. No doubt about it. Uh, I'd say with a, with a possible exception of Metallica. Because as much as Metallica went a different route creatively after the... Or after Injustice for All. I, I was going to say after the Black Album. But I mean, let's be honest. That was not a... That was, that was too big of a departure that you could really consider it thrash anymore. Um, but as far as live shows are concerned, you know, Metallica even on the Black Album was still just absolutely fucking phenomenal. And a masterclass in pacing set list selection performance audience engagement um just the size the scope of it all was just absolutely extraordinary so i'd say maybe with the exception of metallica slayer most certainly is you know best of the best and and i still contend that the big four should be dramatically changed there are a lot of other thrash bands that were way better especially testament um one more and then let's uh let's wrap it up um D. Snyder, my friends, and this is, I'm sad to uh, end on this note, but I have to inform you that D. Snyder is done making solo albums. I'm not feeling this urge. So, uh, yeah, while you weep over that headline, it's time to wrap up the news for this week. That caps off another episode of Into the Necrosphere. Big thanks to Chris Grieg for coming on the show. Make sure you check out the new Woe record, Legacies of Frailty, and also make sure that you sign up for the Amp Wall mailing list. Very excited about that product when it launches because, as he and I said during uh, the or during our conversation, uh, we need resilience in the infrastructure uh, in order to be able to ensure that the underground continues to survive and thrive. Next week, I'll be back my guests are going to be ralph schmidt and mike hill my fellow horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse they themselves are also in some pretty heavyweight bands uh ralph schmidt is giving us an update on author mike hill is giving us an update on tombs and then we're going to uh geek out about all things danzig for about an hour it was a great great episode and it's always a lot of fun getting back together with my bros so make sure that you tune in for that uh whatever it is that you are doing wherever it is that you are Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you bad motherfuckers again next week. Walk around your left me now, drink some cheddar Walk into the thing in the world, so I can kind of do it out